Respiratory tools can be critical in diagnosing and managing breathing issues in people of all ages. Today, we're gonna to take a close look at spirometry and some innovations in respiratory care. My name is Sally Schessler, and I'm Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. Allergy and Asthma Network is a grassroots organization that was begun over 35 years ago by a mom who knew that other mothers like her needed resources and support. Our mission is to end the needless death and suffering due to allergies, asthma, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ellen Becker. Ellen is a professor at the, uh, in the Department of Cardiopulmonary Sciences at Rush University. Her PhD is in education, and she's been a respiratory therapist for 44 years. Her research interests span the education topics of respiratory care, professionalism, and disease management. She also conducts research in diagnostics and works clinically in the Pulmonary Function Laboratory. Dr. Becker, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your expertise. Thank you, Sally. I'm delighted to be here, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's been able to join the webinar. I do want to list one conflict of interest before I get into my topic, and that is I'm currently a member of a working group that involves the organizations of CHEST, American Thoracic Society, Canadian Thoracic Society, and the American Association for Respiratory Care, which is working on developing a research statement to um, identify both the evidence and the gaps in our knowledge of using race and ethnicity in interpreting PFTs. Um, I'm excited today to review three main topics. And one is how we conduct spirometry. So this is how we get the numbers that appear on your pulmonary function reports. The second is to look at a couple themes regarding interpretation of spirometry. And then I'm gonna close with a controversial topic is, should we be using race and ethnicity for the predicted equations that give us our normal values with spirometry? So as we get into the topic, I realize we might have a, people from a variety of professions. So I'm gonna go through just a few basics here. Um, many of you have seen this graphic on the lower left which shows uh, what happens to different lung volumes. So right now, I'm assuming everybody is sitting quietly at rest and you're breathing at your tidal volume. If you were to breathe in deeper and deep, 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 deep to fill your lungs all the way up to the maximum, you would be at your total lung capacity. And then if you let the air out and then really started pushing, pushing, squeezing, squeezed every little bit of air out of your lungs as you could, you would um, not be able to squeeze everything out. You would still have some volume left over and that volume is your residual volume. So let's see how this applies to two common spirometry tests that we do. The first one is our vital capacity measurement. And this is sometimes called the slow vital capacity, but if you see the letters V and C without uh, the letter F in front of it, they're really referring to the slow vital capacity. And to do that test, we have individuals breathe normally. So we have them breathe at rest. And then we ask them to take in as deep a breath as they can. And we have them pull, pull, pull until their lungs are all the way full. And then we have them blow it out, blow it out, squeeze it out, squeeze it out till you get all the way to the bottom. And I wanted to describe that test because I want to contrast it with the forced vital capacity. So this, the main difference in this test is that the uh, exhalation and following inhalation are forced and we're trying to do them quickly. So at the start of this test and what we can see, let's look at the bottom graphic first. We're gonna have individuals pull the breath all the way in and then we want them to blast it out. We want them to force it out so that they push, push the air out as quickly as they can until their lungs are all the way empty. And once their lungs are all the way empty, then we ask them to breathe in deep and fast. And that can be shown on our classic volume time graph as well as our flow volume loop. So here we see that forced blast of air out on exhalation until they squeeze the air all the way out. And then at the very end, we want them to inhale deep and fast, pull the air in. So here's a picture again of that volume time graph, just pointing out when you take that maximal inhalation, you're breathing in to total lung capacity. 
blasting it out as hard and as fast as you can until you get all the way down to residual volume. The maximal volume that you exhale your forced vital capacity, if we trace this over on this particular example, it looks like we're around 4.8 liters. But another important measurement we make is our FEV1. How much of that forced expiratory volume did we exhale in one second? So here was our starting point. We move over one second. And if I were to make a measure, it looks to me like maybe it's about 4.1 seconds. And the reason why we're going to pay attention to those two important numbers, our FEV1 and our FVC, is the ratio of those two numbers tell us whether or not our patient has any airflow limitation or an obstructive pattern. I do want to point out on this uh, formula on the screen, I have VC. If you did a slow vital capacity, we would, it's preferential to use that value for your denominator, but some of us um, in our spirometry measurements, um, predominantly in clinic settings, we don't measure the slow vital capacity as well as the force, we simply do the force maneuver. Here are some images showing you patterns, what a normal volume time graphic looks like. It's just like the one I showed you before. And I'm contrasting it with two major patterns we see in lung disease. One pattern is called an obstructive pattern. And what happens, and those, are, those patterns occur with individuals with conditions such as asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, where we have a major scoop on exhalation. So we're going to notice a couple things with this, with the comparison between uh, obstructive and normal. Our, our peak flow is often less. Our peak flow is our highest flow rate that we achieve on our flow volume graphic. We have this major scoop, major drop in flow rate. We don't have this steady decline like we saw in our normal graphic. And oftentimes the volume is coming out so slow and it, and it takes a long time to get that volume out because of the airflow obstruction. In a more classic restrictive pattern, those are conditions where our lung volumes are low. So you can think of individuals with um, muscle weakness. You, uh, if the pediatric population, might, you might think of uh, muscular dystrophy. Um, you can also have um, individuals with uh, you know, spinal cord injuries or uh, some lung diseases such as interstitial lung diseases, their flow graphics are skinnier. They cannot get as much volume out, so they're a little narrower. That's their predominant difference. So when we actually make these measurements, we need to follow guidelines to make sure that the, that the values we're reporting are accurate. And there has been a recently released um, standardization of spirometry update. And I have the reference here and I have all the different criteria we should be thinking about listed on the screen. I'm not gonna read them to you, but I do wanna show you examples of several of them. Earlier I talked about our FEV1. So that's that really important measure we make as part of determining that someone has airflow obstruction or airflow limitation. And it's important to know what is going to be our zero point. So when we count our one second over, we need to make sure we're starting at the right point. And that point is the point where our peak flow rate, where the fastest flow rate, that line in red, crosses the zero line. And this inset has it expanded. And one of the things you can see in it, it happens reasonably frequently, that when individuals take that deep breath in, and instead of immediately conducting their blast, they let a little bit of volume leak out before they really get blasting. And we can see in the second example, we have a much greater amount of air that leaked out before we started measuring the FEV1. And so that can lead to inaccuracies. That volume that leaks out is called your back extrapolation volume. And the criteria that the standards ask us to follow is that if that volume is less than 5% of the force bottle capacity or 0.1 liter, whichever these two is greater, then you still have an acceptable test. So it's possible that this could be an acceptable test only if this volume here that leaked out is less than 0.1 liters or if it is, if 5% if of the force bottle capacity 
is um, a larger value, that's the value we would use. Another common thing that happens is sometimes patients, while they're blasting the air out, they are putting so much effort into the blast that they close off their vocal cords, they close their glottis. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this beautiful rise and then abruptly a horizontal line. And so these are two graphics taken from the same patient. In the first example on the left, the force bottle capacity measurement was 3.2 liters. However, when we worked with the patient to keep the glottis open, we were able to get out 3.49 liters. So here's a quick tip if you're observing glottic closure is to ask the patient while they're blasting out is to think of the letter O. We don't want them to say the letter O as they're blasting out, but if they think of the letter O, it, it helps them keep their glottics open and you can get rid of this artifact and uh, achieve an acceptable test. The, the biggest changes in the newer guidelines are looking at end of forced exhalation criteria. So those of you who have been conducting spirometry know that we used to ask patients to exhale a minimum of six seconds. Well, sometimes people with healthy lungs, younger patients, they could exhale their entire volume in less than six seconds. So now we're using um, a couple different criteria. We're really wanting to make sure that the majority of the air is out and the flow rate is really low. But because we're scientific about it, we ask our machines are programmed to look at flow rates that drop below 0.025 liters per second. So when the flow rate gets really low and your machine is programmed to this value, you should get an alert to say, okay, the flow rate has dropped sufficiently. We're going to pretend that, the, we're not gonna pretend, we're going to accept that this is the end of the test. A second criteria that's really important is that we don't want people exhaling more than 15 seconds. So who exhales for 15 seconds? Those with profound obstructive defects. And those individuals, as they're pushing and straining to get rid of all the gas flow in 15 seconds, oftentimes become lightheaded, and yet the amount of air that they're functionally adding to their vital capacity is extremely low. So once we reach the 15 second mark, we can consider it and a test criteria. Another acceptability criteria is when someone may not have met one of these two criteria, but they produced a force vital capacity, which is larger than any of the previously observed efforts. Uh, because after all, this is a maximal test. In order to have a good forced vital capacity, we need to make sure we get somebody's maximal amount of gas expired. Some other things that can happen is sometimes we see this little divot here near the beginning of exhalation. And this is a classic sign of a blocked mouthpiece. So when someone sticks their tongue in the mouthpiece, you can that's usually the cause. You can see this little divot. And so we'll just remind them at that point to um, make sure that their tongue is under the mouthpiece so that we do not have that dilemma. I usually do not instruct patients to keep their tongue away from the mouthpiece when I give initial instructions, because once you start talking about their tongue, they start thinking about it and they wonder, where is my tongue? So I just bring it up if I, if I see this in one of my attempts. Sometimes there's a leak. So this is someone did a beautiful deep inspiration, great start of test, blasted the gas out and part way through, there's a little dip here. Because it's such a small dip, I don't think this individual tried to take, to sneak a little breath in to push more air out. But what happened is probably their lips were less snugly sealed uh, around the mouthpiece and that was the cause of the leak. When we do our force vital capacity, we're measuring what's happening on exhalation, but keep in mind, in order to have a terrific forced exhalation and a great volume, you need to take a deep breath in first. And that's what this next criteria is addressing. Let's focus on the graphic for a moment. This is someone who forced the air out all the way to empty, took a deep and fast breath in, and notice they 
inhaled more than they exhaled. And so when you see this inhalation being deeper than the amount somebody exhaled, we need to evaluate for this particular acceptability criteria. So let me, let's start here with our forced inspiratory vital capacity. That was 3.49. And I'm gonna subtract off my forced vital capacity, which is my expiratory numbers. And I found that I have a difference of 0.17 liters. So my criteria is that it needs to be less than 0.1 liters. Well, I didn't make that one. Or 5% of my forced vital capacity. Here, when I make my forced vital 5% of my force vital capacity winds up giving me an equivalent value. So I just barely met acceptability criteria on this assessment. So that, that was just a few uh, quick updates on the uh, on a few revised acceptability criteria. Let's move on and talk about some interpretation issues. We have had a change in how bronchodilator responsiveness should be interpreted. So let's begin in the middle of the slide. Here is an instance where I measured a forced vital capacity, my pre-value 2.9 liters, and my post-value after giving a bronchodilator 3.35 liters. When we evaluate whether someone is responsive, the thing that stayed the same is we evaluate either the force vital capacity or the FEV1. So if either of those two criteria has a significant change, we are going to state that our patient had positive bronchodilator responsiveness. What's different is in the past, we took our post bronchodilator value minus our pre times 100, and we used to divide it by our pre-bronchodilator value. We are now going to be dividing it by the predicted value. So let's look at an example. My force vital capacity is 3.5 liters. We're gonna subtract off the 2.9, multiply by 100, but this time I'm gonna divide it by 3.12 liters, the predicted value for that individual. I did the same thing for the FEV1 measurement, and we can See, in both of these examples, it is greater than the 10% difference, which is the minimum difference you need to have to, to state that our patient has a positive bronchodilator responsiveness. And the reason for that change is if someone was really compromised and they had a very low pre-value on one assessment and they were having a better day and had a post value that was different, um, the individual's lung function for that day is, is or for those two times, is, is varying. And so by using this predicted value, it's a, consist, it's a more uh, consistent number. Now let's talk about how we figure out what is normal. I just referred on the previous slide to using predicted values. What I want us to focus on is this image in the center. When it comes to predicted values, they come from population studies where we use healthy individuals of various ages, heights, sex, uh, race, and ethnicity. And after a lot of values are gathered um, for someone at a particular age, height, sex, and ethnicity, a mean value is collected. Now what's something you need to keep in mind when we look at measuring values is when you have a population where there's a lot of values, the variability, the spread of the line is much smaller. And that's what happens when we sample the younger population. We have more younger people, people not everybody lives to be older. And, and when individuals become older, sometimes they develop health issues and they may not be healthy. And that changes the width of the uh, of the information that's gathered. So for that reason, we don't want to use a fixed value like 80% of predicted, which some of you are familiar with, because 80% of predicted is looking at 80% of the mean. What we really want to use are the 95% confidence intervals. So a confidence interval of 95% states that if we sampled 100 individuals, 95 
of those individuals would likely fall in our competence interval range. With our older population, we have wider competence intervals, so our range of normal values are much wider. When we look at our spirometry re results, we are going to be paying attention to the lower fifth percentile. I'm not, it doesn't apply for the spirometry test. When we do lung volumes, having a value where values are higher, we'll look at the, anything above the 95th percentile as being too high. But if your values are less than the fifth percentile, we're gonna call that our lower limit of normal, uh, fifth percentile of the 95% confidence interval, that's what we're gonna consider normal. Now, when you are close to the lower limit of normal, then we need to say, okay, we have our spirometry results, but we also need to take into account what is the person's medical history? What are their physical findings? What's the pretest probability of having some uh, disease? So in other words, we're not going to make a diagnosis based upon spirometry alone. We love our spirometry, but it doesn't tell the entire picture. One of the newer trends in the standards is to make use of Z-scores. Let's talk about what a Z-score is. So a Z-score is just taking the value you obtain for your patient, your sample, and you subtract it for the mean and standard deviation from your predicted set. And that's basically standardizing your patient's score to um, a broader population. So let's use an easy example. Let's pretend someone was right at the mean. Their score would be right at the mean, our numerator would be zero, and their z-score would be zero. So what we're gonna consider z-scores less than 1.64 as being abnormal. Notice one point, a z-score of 1.64 corresponds to the fifth percentile. So if it's less than 1.64, we're going to consider it normal, less than the lower limit of normal. Let's go ahead and get some practice with this. Here's a force vital capacity measurement. The z-score is 1.34, minus 1.34. That is to the right of minus 1.64. I'm going to consider this value normal. My FEV1, minus 3.78. That is way to the left of minus 1.64, so that's a normal as well as my ratio. Coming over to post bronchodilator, my force vital capacity is to the right of minus 1.64, so it's normal. These two values are to the left. And it can be graphically depicted. These images are taken from the journal article I have cited on the screen. And it's uh, what is recommended for how we present our data on test reports. Notice the asterisk to the right of the lower limit of normal, to the right of minus 1.64 for force vital capacity and the other values over here to the left. Here is the uh, interpretation algorithm, the revised version in the 2021 new technical standard. Uh, we can follow this down. We, as I mentioned earlier, for obstructive conditions, we look at this ratio. Is my ratio of FEV1 to force vital capacity greater than the fifth percentile? If it's not, it means it's less, it's small. Then we make an assessment of the forced vital capacity. If the forced vital capacity is more than the fifth percentile, like our previous example, then we can conclude this person has airflow obstruction. If the forced vital capacity is greater than the, uh, is not greater than the fifth percentile, then it's possible that the person has a restrictive or and mixed disorder, but we really need lung volumes to confirm that. If we have a normal ratio, we also reassess our force vital capacity. And if that's normal, we have a normal spirometry. If I am not greater than the fifth percentile, it's abnormal. It's possible to have restriction. Again, I can't confirm that without getting lung volumes. So let's move on to uh, a little stickier topic, and that's from where do we get our normal lung volumes and our reference ranges. And the reason it's sticky at the moment is there is a lot of debate about whether we should be using race or ethnic origin in obtaining these values. So let's um, 
let's address that topic. So what I did is I went into the literature to see how race and ethnicity impacts barometry. And as part of that journey, I also read some recent literature that questioned how race has been used in medicine. So what I want to do is frame the remaining content from my presentation around three themes that Dr. Weiss and her colleagues worked on that sum and summarize those values. And the first value that they addressed is, are the findings based upon robust evidence and statistical analyses? Okay, so here I have three relatively recent studies that show a consistent difference in spirometry results between African-Americans and whites. So this table focuses only on two race categories to make it easier for me to make my point, but I want everybody in our audience to know that I think you all matter. The first study was a validation study of the NHANES-3 data. And this was a 1999 population-based study that included whites, African-Americans, and Mexican-Americans. As shown on the slide, NHANES-3 showed that on average, African-Americans had a 15% lower force vital capacity and FEV1 compared to their white counterparts. The validation study shown here uses data from the MESA lung study, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, and it was a multi-center prospective cohort style that involved 48 to 84 year olds, and it was conducted in 2004, 2006. In this validation study, they found that African-Americans had a 19% lower values than whites with spirometry vol volumes. Thus, these similar findings show a consistent difference of at least 15%. The second study by Berner and Bernie and Hooper used a limited data set from the atherosclerosis risk in community studies that evaluated spirometry between 1986 and 2002. And they had 4,000 in, in individuals in this subset of a, of a larger study. The, they found, if you do the math, the males had a drop in forest vital capacity of 15% difference between African-Americans and whites, and the African-Americans males had a 13% drop in their FEV1. Females, slightly smaller drops, 13% in forced vital capacity and 10% um, in females. Similar findings resulted uh, from the Global Lung Function Initiative, the third study on, on this slide. And after reviewing this, you know, I've just I concluded that we have several large study relatively recent data that they show a consistent finding of the black race as having lower lung volumes. However, after doing a little more reading and uh, reflection, maybe pour, pay attention to two additional factors related to robust evidence. Good scientific practice requires that our measures are valid and reliable. And here is where race becomes problematic. Let's look at the validity of race as a measure. For a measure to be valid, it needs to measure the intended variable. Race is a socially constructed term and it may mask some modifiable risk factors. Most studies on spirometry do not account for environmental attributes that may affect you know, what we're studying. So a few authors have actually studied my modifiable risk factors. However, most studies only suggest potential sources of difference. And here, you know, social science research is challenging because the variables and their measures are either difficult to access or the variables are multifactorial and complex. And as a result, this research is not often conducted. So one of the assumptions we make in using race with PFT measures is that genetic differences reliably track with race. In reality, we are combining a social term, race, with a biological pathway. So how did using race with PFTs begin? Dr. Lundy Braun provides an extensive history in the article I cited on the slide. Race was associated with spirometry back in the 1800s when the Bureau of the War Department measured PFTs to certify a soldier's fitness for military service. The chief medical officer of the Bureau, Jedediah Baxter, expressed reservations about the precision of racial categories and noted that the unique meaning of race might make it difficult for foreigners to understand their findings because race categorization was this uniquely 
American phenomenon. Maglo and colleagues looked at genetic linkages and refute the concept of dis distinct races. Some Sub-Saharan Africans differ more within each other than Sub-Saharan metapopulations and Eurasians. Their research groups describe our current classification for race as being in the island model, where we reference geographically isolated populations to establish races. Thus, we need to be careful about linking race to biological differences. Let's take another scientific measurement concept, reliability. A few issues still arise when we follow the, the pulmonary function guidelines of using self-reported race for lung function tests. The Office of Management and Budgets has categories for five races and two ethnicities that are used for the U.S. Census. We have no guidance for those who do not neatly fit into the predefined categories. Further, individuals may have changing identities over time. These may change with an individual's evolving self-image or as social and political meanings change. Maybe someone discovers something new about their family history that they didn't know before. The most accurate measure is ancestry. Yet, yeah, how do we handle mixed races? The large population studies used for our reference equations did not use ancestry when gathering their data. Kiefer et al. looked at a subgroup of the MESA study, uh, 3,965 participants who agreed to undergo genetic testing to confirm ancestry. They computed reference equations using sex, age, and height, both with a full sample of healthy volunteers and with race or ethnic specific equations. They found there was less precision with the race specific equations as the confidence intervals were one third higher. When they added race and ethnicity into the regression equations, it only explained 1% of the variance. Thus, perhaps we need to think why we routinely use race in PFT reference equations. The GLI reference equations, the, the newest set of uh, predicteds, have an other category based on a whole sample, and that's an option for us to consider. Other variables affecting the accuracy of race as a measure uh, occurs with immigrants and acculturation. For example, you know, predicted values of those who live in China versus Chinese Americans who were living longer in the U.S., they also vary. So at this stage, I recognize that the variable race lacks fidelity, and thus it makes me question whether the evidence I presented earlier qualifies as robust. Dr. Lundy Braun has been exploring the theme of race and the spirometer for over 15 years. In her systematic review, she looked at the number of studies that defined race and ethnicity, was, which was only 17%. And that percentage increased more in more recently, like those completed after 2000. So I just reviewed issues related to the validity and reliability of race as individual measures. Here I want to consider how race data is collected and reported. For example, if data extracted from the medical record, do you know who provided the information? Was it the individual receiving care, an admission specialist, the clinician, or someone else? Often, we don't know. Research needs to clarify the source of data for greater transparency. Further, we have no consensus on the categories we should be using. The first US census in 1790 had three categories. 1977, there were five categories. 1997, there were five categories and two ethnicities. Our race categories are constantly changing and the Office of Management and Budgets makes these decisions at a political, not a scientific level. You can also see in Dr. Lundy's review that very few articles evaluated socio socioeconomic status. Over the years, the reasons for, low, for the, you know, explaining why we have lower lung volumes in non-whites has changed. More recently, the explanations have been more appropriate, such as not knowing the uh, cause or seeking other relevant factors. Although I question the role of race uh, in PFTs, I'm not completely certain about what the next step should be. The second value that Dr. Bias and her colleagues recommended was to determine if race adjustment would relieve or exacerbate health inequities. On the surface, this sounds simple, but I think uh, how we apply this value differs when you consider the context of either clinical, occupational health, or epidemiology. So let's break this down and talk about the clinical context first. <laughs> 
A limited amount of literature on whether to adjust PFTs for race highlights different approaches for different types of clinical decisions. For example, when using PFTs to facilitate a diagnosis, the ratio is usually not affected because generally the FEV1 and force fetal capacity are reduced almost equally. Therefore, race adjustment does not matter when we are uh, looking for an obstructive defect. It does matter, however, when restrictive conditions are present. The most challenging circumstances occur when the patient's values are nearest to the normal thresholds. There is the risk of underestimating the impairment, which could lead to reduced treatment or compensation or restricted access to disability, home assisted ventilation, rehab programs, and lung transplantation. When the clinical decision relates to prognosis, however, Bernie and Hooper recommend that clinicians do not adjust for race when evaluating the force vital capacity. Think about it this way. There are two individuals of the same age, height, and sex, but they have different races. They both need a sufficient vital capacity to carry out basic life functions. If your vital capacity is not sufficient for a periodic side breath or an effective cough, your race doesn't matter. Thus, if the clinical question being addressed is related to prognosis, do not adjust for race. On the other hand, overestimating the impairment could lead to unnecessary testing, higher life insurance premiums, not being eligible for certain professions, um, and or not being able to apply for clinical trials. So that's going to take me into just um, a brief comment about occupational health. So back in 1978, the Federal Register published cotton dust standards, and they recommended using a scaling factor of 0.85 to not inadvertently uh, create discrimination in hiring practices. And so here's a clear application of attempting to relieve health inequities. The third value that I wanted to touch on from Dr. Vias's work is um, to conduct research that evaluates the plausible causes for some of the differences we're seeing. Although numerous potential um, it, environmental mechanisms are discussed in the literature, there are limited studies. Future work needs to identify the social and physical environmental factors that influence lung function. And I also might add, how do we measure it? We don't have clear metrics on these. So earlier, I addressed limitations of measuring race. However, Borel and colleagues point out that totally ignoring race is counterproductive. If no measures of race are used, inequities could continue and our opportunities for creating social change could be limited. So here we need to remember that the use of race for epidemiologic analyses have a very different goal than race as a part of clinical guidance. In addition to race, we need good measures of these environmental uh, factors to uncover why we're seeing what we're seeing. So where does all this information leave us? The current evidence base is sufficiently strong to question our current practices and rethink how race is used in diagnostic testing. However, we still lack a sufficiently strong evidence base to provide clear evidence of how to change. One thing we can all do in the short run is to reflect on our assumptions. So Kaplan in Bennett's article on how to report race in the literature provides helpful guidance that we can immediately use as we critically read the literature, design research studies, and write or review articles for publication. So for example, did the authors identify why they measured race? Is race important for adjusting a PFT value or could a composite reference value be used instead, instead something like the um, um, something like the other category in the GLI guidelines. So was race defined? Do authors identify the source of their race data? Did the race data come from forced categories and could individuals sele select from more than one category? So in their findings, do researchers report in their tables and text findings on race or did they spy specify race categories, which implies that there was a forced choice involved. When it comes to using race and ethnic specific reference values, we need to consider the context. We also need more evidence to identify how the use or absence of race reference equations impacts clinical outcomes. 
in the interim, consider using reference sense that encompass all participants, such as the GLI's other category, for when we're especially when we're working with those of either mixed race or unknown backgrounds. So ultimately, we need to use the three overarching values I share to reevaluate the changes needed in our clinical practices to positively influence outcomes for all. The working group I referred to in my conflict of interest statement is presently drafting a document during this uncomfortable stage where we lack sufficient data to recommend a specific path forward. And I'm really thrilled that we're rethinking some of our past practices and tackling this challenging topic. I know that the slides will be available for sharing. And for those of you who are interested in this topic, I included a, a, a couple slides of reference. And um, I'd like to thank you for listening. And I welcome any questions you may have. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Becker. This was just a great presentation. Uh, we do have quite a few questions. Uh, one of them is uh, from back in the beginning of the presentation when you were showing the forced vital capacity charts. And our question is, what is the small mini loop inside of the main flow volume loop? Okay, since we have slides, let's look at it. So what we have people do before they do their forced vital capacity, and let's, um, let's look at this one, this slide here. This little loop is showing you the individual's tidal breathing. So we have them breathe normally, and then we have them take that deep breath in, and then the outer loop is the actual force vital capacity. And the reason we do that is we like to, I won't get into the details of interpretation, but we like to see how the tidal breathing loop is positioned inside of the larger force vital capacity. If it shifts uh, direction, it has other implications. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, comes from the section on glottic closure, and they okay. are asking, what's the difference between glottic closure and plateau? Oh, that's a, we have good thinkers in the audience today. So a glottic closure, <laughs> doesn't it look exactly like a plateau? It certainly does. And what, what is a clue, and this comes from experience, Notice it's rising, 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 and the plateau is very abrupt. Let's contrast that what's happening here. So when you see the glottic closure occurring earlier, and some of this helps if you know you're a little bit about your patient's background. So look how long this person expired. This is somebody with um, an, uh, has some mild obstruction. So by knowing their history and being a little seasoned, we should have some sense that plateauing abruptly a little bit earlier in the expiration phase is going to be our clue. So I realize it's subtle. It's one of those things where experience and knowing something about your patient helps. Okay, thank you so much. Um, next question is, it's interesting that the criteria to achieve one of the three EOFE indicators that the expiratory time should not be allowed to be taken beyond 15 seconds. Are the softwares being adjusted to recognize this new criteria? Right. So here we're dependent upon our partners in industry. And, um, and some of the, and I think it may depend upon what software version, what equipment you have, but my recommendation would be to, for those in the audience to reach across to their vendor and, and find out if there are software upgrades available. But because these criteria came out in 2019, our, our vendors are, are great partners and we'll be working on that. Okay, the next question is, will these new values be used in the new Reach the Peak Asthma Educators tutorial or test? I am embarrassed to say that I am not familiar with Reach the Peak and what that, um, what that test is. Um, and I don't know if perhaps we have somebody else on the call who could uh, well, I perhaps handle another question, someone who has an answer to that question could just type it in and we can share it with our audience. 
Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you know of any studies specific to Native Americans in spirometry? I believe I have read one, um, and um, I don't know if it's for sure in my reference list. In the reference list, I use predominantly studies. I believe there's one in uh, rural Americans. I know there is work in um, Aboriginal New Zealanders uh, in terms of uh, where things fit. But if the person who asked the questions wants to reach across to me, I have a, a master list and I can look at that and see if I can provide a helpful response. I'm assuming that this is related to where Native Americans fall aligned with our predicted values. Now, whether it has been studied or not um, is one issue, and it's important for us to study all of, all of us, um, not just here in the US, but also around the world. But I think the stickier issue is once you know it has been studied, do you make an adjustment? So if our adjustment, and this is why it's, it's so challenging, is we don't wanna normalize uh, something that is potentially a disadvantage. So if individuals have lower lung volumes because they've had poor nutrition, worse prenatal care, more environmental exposures, and their, and their population norm is less, and we say, well, we don't expect as much from you, um, and we're going to call you normal, we might be disadvantaging individuals who could be benefiting. And so that's, that's our tricky challenge. But there are a lot of challenges, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I, if you walked away with saying, I have more questions than answers, um, I, I, simp I, I, I empathize and would have to agree with you because I still have more questions than answers myself. But again, if you do want to reach across to me, um, you can certainly reach me via email. Well, and this always shows that, that there's more research to do, and that's always a good thing. Okay, our next question is, what are thoughts regarding athletes such as swimmers and their predicted values? Okay, again, I, some of this may be, what is the context of our question? Is our question to look at um, whether they have abnormal lung function or have, um, have uh, we might be evaluating swimmers for bronchodilator responsiveness, perhaps chlorine in pools could be triggering some um, uh, bron bronchial constriction. So we would uh, not treat a swimmer any, any different. I may not be understanding the question uh, correctly. So I think it would depend upon, it all, it all begins with what question are we trying to answer? Are we trying to look at abnormal lung function? Are we looking at attributes of swimmers? Swimmers need to have good lung volumes to be able to put out the amount of work they put out and compete. Um, so I would, I would need just a little bit more details to give a very specific answer. We have had a couple of people ask, how can we receive the slides? And I'll take that question. Uh, you can, the slides will be posted on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. If you stay on the homepage and go all the way to the bottom, you'll find the recording as well as the printouts of the slides for this, this uh, webinar. And it should be posted within 48 hours. Here's a great timely question. Uh, Margaret wants to know, what are the current recommendations for spirometry with regard to COVID? Okay, so actually conducting a spirometry test, that'll be standard. But So what I think the question is really asking is, do we need to take any protective steps either for staff in the room or subsequent patients who may be using the same room and the same equipment? So I'm going to take this from the, if someone has active COVID and they're really sick, getting a spirometry isn't going to work. This is <laughs> this test takes a lot of effort and uh, we won't really get a meaningful value. So let me take it from the infection control perspective. You need to, if you, if you had the perfect world, you would be testing in a room with negative airflow so that uh, we would um, limit contamination. Our staff all wears uh, personal protective equipment, um, N95 mask or a type of capper or papper uh, device and 
gowns and gloves. We wipe down equipment and something we would do with every single testing, whether we know a person's diagnosis or not, is we would use a, um, uh, a viral um, filter to make sure that we do not cross contaminate our equipment. We, and, but we typically do well, not test patients while they're sick. Okay, good clarification there. Okay, we have a no next question, and this is from a friend of mine, uh, Michael, which is lovely to see your name on the on the webinar, but I hope I read this correctly, Michael. Uh, it, can you clarify the interpretation of FVC slash FEV1 when the FVC is, for example, 90% predicted and FEV1 is 80% predicted, which is below the 85% we use in pediatrics? Do you use the ratios percent predicted value to determine normal limits? Okay, let me let me see if I can ha answer that question by using a slide, just so we keep all these. So to help all of us keep all these letters straight in our heads. So let me see if I can dissect this, Michael. So when you interpret. So we can look at, is our FBC normal or abnormal? We can look at, is our FEV1 abnormal or abnormal? When we make the assessment for the ratio, FEV1 to FBC, there is also a lower limit of normal in a Z-score. Your reference to pediatrics is interesting because children can exhale their gas volume much faster than adults. So their normal range, their, uh, their expected range is a much higher value than someone such as myself who's older. So I'm entitled to have a much lower ratio than a five-year-old and both of us can still be normal. So when we're making the comparison, we're comparing it to the individual's age, sex, height, and I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna waffle on the uh, race ethnicity portion. So we're not, we're not, um, and then this reference did, Sally, did I recall in your question, was there a, a, a 0.7 value in part of the question? Well, 90% predicted and 80% predicted, which okay, was below the age they use in pediatrics. Okay, so we're not going to use percent predicteds. I should have maybe started with that. We're going to go with Z scores and lower limits of normal. We're going to pay attention to confidence intervals. So we're, um, we're not going to pick a fixed value. We're going to uh, you have our computers help us out, pull out the reference value for that person and see where it fits with the lower limit of normal. We're not going to use a fixed ratio for FEV1 and FVC. There was in the gold COPD guidelines, they were using 70% just as a screening tool. But um, uh, the most accurate way to do it is to use the, the lower limit of normal and which will correspond to your Z-scores. So that's the shift we wanna make, have people uh, make. And Michael, if you need to reach out to me, I'd be happy to discuss it further. Okay, our next question is, what's being addressed when you have a patient that has several race factors? We have a very diversified patient population in our area of practice, Black, Hispanic, and Asian. We've experienced any and all combinations of those. Yes, that's why we have the current dilemma that we have. My inclination um, would be to follow the GLI 2012 standards. And when you have somebody of mixed race categories and you're using the GLI predicted, select the other category. So what they did for the other is they took the four groups they had, um, African, uh, Blacks, uh, Whites, Northeast Asians, Southeast Asian, and they took all the quality data they had, they threw it in one big pot, and they created a reference equation off of that mix. So the current guidelines, the GLI recommendations are to use the other category for mixed race. And they have GLI categories for ages four through the 80s. So it covers all age groups. 
Okay, uh, someone wrote in and said that uh, Reach the Peak that we talked about earlier is a nurse asthma educator course, which gives extra credentials. I, I'm an asthma educator, uh, Ellen, and I had not heard of this. So I think we're on the same page with that one. So, you let me uh, off. I got a little nervous on that question, like I was going <laughs> to lose it right at the end. Well, I, I you know, I'm going to look into it for sure. Uh, but uh, we have time for one more question, and this one is very timely for the situations we find ourselves in. Uh, when you're dealing with a transgender patient regarding choosing their sex, this person had read that you're, you're supposed to choose the sex at birth as the one that should be used. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yes, there is a clear criteria, and I was going to see if I have it on the slide, where we want to use birth sex. So the first question we ask somebody is, how do you identify? Because we want, to, we want to respect our person first, right? So how do you identify? The follow-up question is, what is your sex at birth? And we don't know how, we don't know the long-term effects of uh, hormone therapy uh, that it could have on lung function. So with our current knowledge, um, the belief and the guidance in the technical standard is to use birth sex. But again, first question, how do you identify? So that we let the person we're working with know that we're going to respect them with their identity first. And then we follow up and let them know why we're recording birth sex uh, for predictors. Well, thank you. That's very, very timely to know that question. So, Dr. Becker, thank you so much for everything today. We totally appreciate you being with us. And at, at this time, I'd like to also thank our listeners for being with us today. So uh, we, we really enjoy taking a good look at spirometry and how to, to help, how to interpret the data that it helps us collect. Please join us for our next webinar on long COVID-19, a fresh perspective on the condition and concerns on Thursday, April 28th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can register for this and all of our webinars at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Scroll all the way down to the bottom of the homepage to find our webinar recordings and links for registration. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, please take two to three minutes to complete the evaluation survey here at the end. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we do use the data. Well, this is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We can all breathe better together when we provide the care that all people with asthma deserve. Have a great day.